Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure. Um, and you see, okay, so you see st here is still my, my favorite logo, Taco. Unfortunately, finally did not, did not make it. Um, so we have another one. I was also expecting uh, that for the buffet yesterday, but okay. So uh, what I will show you is just a, a progress report of the project um, Key 08, um, which is catalysis by uh, yeah, ultra-thin uh, perovskite films. So here is the team P08. So I will start with a reminder of the, of the project goals. Um, several people are new and maybe some others don't remember. And then I will also show you some first results along these um, directions, also including some highlights of the posters that were presented yesterday, but also they are presented today. And so maybe you want to have a look then, and then um, finally uh, show you some of the, of the plans. So I will just try to discuss uh, major aspects. So I will not go into every little detail. Um, so it will be rather a magical mystery tour. And so for maybe you got interested in some aspects, then just please look at the posters. OK, and finally, maybe you find out what that is about. OK, so there in the project, there are two big parts. Um, uh, it's uh, experimentally. So the first one is to work with thin films of uh, yeah, what the final goal would be, epitaxial lanthanum cobaltite films. Uh, the reason we uh, chosen this as a starting material is because we have quite some experience in growing thin cobalt oxide spinel films on an iridium 100 single crystal as a model system. We have worked with this before. Uh, we can do characterization by lead and uh, XPS. You have seen these methods yesterday already. And then the idea was, well, it's a, we know it's a simple idea, just to modify the surface by lanthanum. So we just evaporate lanthanum and then yeah, we see, uh, we see, let's say, what we get. And then we use the typical methods that we use to characterize the surfaces with infrared spectroscopy, uh, XPS, surface X-ray diffraction, and preferentially all yeah, at elevated um, gas pressures to be more uh, similar to real um, catalysis. And uh, we also wanted to start out with this. But then finally, uh, what we did is we started out with this. So it's not, it's not a typo. Yeah? Uh, and you may have heard about it in the previous talk, because in the beginnings, um, in, the, in the transition, let's say, between Foxy and Taku, we were also thinking about uh, uh, battery materials. And this lithium cobalt oxide is sort of the famous uh, good enough cathode. Okay? So it's not only good enough for the, for the batteries, it's also after the inventor and Nobel laureate good enough. So uh, to start this, what, what, what we did is um, to make this lithium modification, and that is on the, on the poster by Thomas Haunold. So what we did is we used a commercial source of lithium, um, which is a lithium chromate in a boat. And then if you uh, heat it up, then this uh, chromate will decompose. And the idea is that the chrome will alloy also with the boat materials, with the zirconium aluminum alloy, and stay behind. And also the oxygen should stay behind, and then you just uh, evaporate uh, metallic lithium. Um, so the, we did that, and we also characterized then films that we made on, a, in this case, a nickel foil. Uh, with lithium and looked into the, the XPS spectra of, of lithium. So you here see the lithium 1S, and we were able to detect it. But the cross-section of lithium is very small. And so we rather had to go to thicker films. Um, uh, let's say here what is plotted is the number of layers as a function of this uh, deposition time. Uh, but we made films that are around 2 to uh, 6 nanometer in thickness. And then this, we, now we could analyze the, the composition of these films. And what we saw that basically what we get is uh, uh, lithium oxide, lithium 2O. So apparently under the conditions we use, making these really uh, thick films and high evaporation rates, so some of the oxygen also escapes from the chromate, making lithium O. And then with another lithium, you have this lithium 2O. 
Uh, lithium also then gets some, um, some of the water traces that we have in a UHV st chamber still, and there's a little contribution of lithium hydroxide. So with this, we then played around and looked into the thermal stability of such films and see how different components change. But then with this, we were ready to, to work with the cobalt oxide that was the original plan. Yeah? So here, you see the steps, how this is prepared. You start out with the iridium-100 single crystal. Uh, here you see the iridium-4F of the substrate. Then we evaporate cobalt in oxygen do all these annealing treatments, and then you get a well-ordered cobalt 3 or 4 spinel film. Um, this is then in green here, and this uh, relates to the green XPS spectra, cobalt 2P, 3P, and also the, the uh, 2P, and here you have the O1S. Now, on this film, then, we modified this with, with lithium. Again, we got, uh, we wanted just to make a, a monolayer. Uh, here you get a little a little signal, again, of the lithium oxide. You can see the, the lead pattern is blurred, so it's, it's there. Also, if you look in detail, one can see that the lithium uh, reduces a little bit the surface of the cobalt oxide and uh, also, again, gets some uh, traces of water. So these are first indications that we can modify these films, but, of course, you can also imagine that um, the way to a really ordered uh, lithium cobalt oxide film would be still long. Yeah? So you would have to find out the right recipes. And of course, the goal is now to do very similar things with lanthanum. Yeah? But so at least with this, we got some first experience on uh, how to do it and what the difficulties can be. Um, the second part of the project is a different approach to make uh, perovskite films. So in this case, we start out not with a, let's say, single crystalline or well-ordered film, but we just start out with a polycrystalline cobalt foil. And uh, the grain size is in the range of, let's say, 100 micrometers. Um, this you can characterize in the electron microscope with electron backscatter diffraction, and then you can see here color-coded the different crystallographic orientations. And then the idea would be to oxidize this cobalt to cobalt foil to cobalt oxide, like we did before, and again modify it with lanthanum. Now, of course, in such a sample, it does not make sense to have an averaging measurement with standard XPS because you would just average out all the differences. So these kind of samples uh, will then be characterized by uh, scanning photoelectron microscopy. So this is done at the synchrotron. So you have here a focused X-ray beam with a small spot, just 130 nanometers. And then you get a local XPS spectrum. And then if you scan the sample and record all these pixels here, then you can get a, a composition map. And then you know the local composition of these different grains. And the idea is that these kind of samples are more similar to, yeah, for instance, um, films that are made by pulsed laser deposition that Jürgen Flatt's group is working on, or more applied materials, let's say. While the epitaxial films, even though they are not so easy to prepare, they are more like to, uh, similar to the single crystalline samples that uh, Uli Diewold and Michele Riva are, are working on. Uh, another advantage of this kind of approach is that we can use another microscopic method, uh, photoemission electron microscopy. Um, so as a reminder, we illuminate the surface with UV light, uh, and then you create photoelectrons. And these photoelectrons are imaged by a lens system on a screen. And then you also see, because of the different work functions of these crystals, you see also uh, sort of an image related to this. And the advantage is that you can not only see the different crystals in the microscope, which are in this 100 micrometer range, but if you have reactants there, like CO oxidation, then also the reactants change the work function. And this, again, changes the contrast in your microscope. For instance, here we see uh, in an active area, maybe it's just uh, uh, dark here, and uh, an inactive area is, is bright. So all of this is just the concept. No? 
So that's why I put here also symbol photos. So this is just a concept that is not yet the cobalt oxide. Yeah? Um, the big advantage in, in the micro microscopy is, of course, that you can not only get the frozen image, but you can also look into the ongoing catalytic reaction. So for instance, here you see a transition from the uh, inactive to the active state, so the black is active. So you here, for instance, you see how oxygen replaces CO from the surface. You can see this spreading reaction fronts. And this happens when you change experimental conditions like pressure or temperature. That is not really relevant here. It's just you see, let's say, you see what you get and you see what the catalyst is doing. OK, as I said, this is the concept. Now, to follow, follow this, what we, have to, we, what we need is a cobalt. That's easy to do. But then we need also to evaporate lanthanum. And so here are the first steps. In the second part, there's a lanthanum evaporator was uh, um, built by Philip Winkler and, and Yuri Tukorsky. So they have modified a uh, commercial specs evaporator with interchangeable apertures of different shapes. And there is also an automatic controller to, organ, uh, to, to open and close. And wh why is that? Well, because in, for this kind of approach, we don't want just a homogeneous evaporation. Like in the first part, we want a homogeneous evaporation. In this case, we want to have, for instance, a stripe pattern of lanthanum, in this case, on rhodium. Um, so lanthanum reduces the work function, and that's why it's bright. Uh, why is that? Yeah, because if we have a microscope, we can use the microscope if we have features on the surface. Right? If it's homogeneous, it's boring. Um, and then again, these kind of things you can use to follow catalytic reaction. Here is an example, uh, hydrogen oxidation on rhodium forming water. And here one sees in this image there is also something, uh, some pattern formation during the reaction. So we are just in the process of, of analyzing this. So this is very fresh. So that's why I'm showing you as a uh, comparison what happens on a pure, uh, in this case, rhodium surface. Again, you have active areas that are bright and inactive areas that are dark. And so it, during reactions, you see oscillations. You see there's a lot going on on the surface. And this kind of information, eventually, we also want to have for such a you know, lanthanum-modified oxide surface. That brings me then to the, uh, to the third poster. Um, and that was presented uh, yesterday and today by Alexander Genest. So Alexander spent many years, about six years, I think, at the uh, Institute of High Performance Computing, the A-Star in Singapore, together with Not Karush, which who is also in, uh, in, in the audience. And then uh, over the years, we have done several yeah, joint forces studies, let's say, where we tried to combine uh, experimental results. In this case, that is an older paper on uh, palladium single crystals uh, with a DFD modeling and microkinetics to really un uh, understand um, the reactions that we were doing. About a year ago, um, uh, Alexander moved to Vienna, and then we continued this kind of work, but on more complex systems. So in this case, it's palladium nanoparticles. So these palladium nanoparticles are grown in uh, ultra-high vacuum on a thin aluminum oxide film that several of you may know, Georg, for instance. Yeah, but probably the aluminum oxide took, took maybe more than a month. I'm not sure. Um, so you can make these nice and well-faceted uh, crystals. Um, but if you change the recipes, like temperatures and amounts, then you can also make smaller particles. Um, which with rough surfaces. And this is all grown in ultra-high vacuum. And, but then what we do is uh, here down there, there is a so-called high pressure cell. So we can bring this catalyst to this high pressure cell and then do uh, reactions at atmospheric uh, pressure. Also with GC analysis, gas chromatography, so very similar to what you do with powder catalysts. And the reason 100 centigrade stand here is not the limit. It's just we were looking at this reaction. Um, that is also a little bit uh, more complex than CO oxidation. Um, so 
the reaction is here you have uh, one butene and you react it with hydrogen. And what can happen is uh, that you have one butene hydrogenation to uh, butane, but uh, there is also the way of isomerization uh, to tube butene. And you need hydrogen for that. It does not really work well without hydrogen. So um, there is a relatively complex scheme, but we can just measure the experimentally in this cell. And what we find here is a strong particle size effect. Uh, small particles, they really like isomerization to 2-butene a lot. And the big particles, they also like isomerization a lot, but they have a, a, another route uh, more feasible to uh, hydrogenation. Uh, and that's why you have this particle size effect. Um, yeah, that's, that's nice to see, but of course the question is, where, what's, what's the reason for such a, a behavior? Of, and, and in the literature, many things are discussed. Long story. Okay. So, um, and the approach to answer this question, and you can then also see all the details on the poster, is to model these different particles. You see they have facets on the surface. And to model these facets, yeah, well, by just flat surfaces, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Or sometimes you have also... Uh, 110 or, 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 or uh, edges or steps, and this is the 211. And then uh, here, Alexander and Notka and, 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 and the group, they have calculated all reaction barriers. So starting here from the middle, from the 1 butene to the left, it's the isomerization. And from here, the middle to the right, is the hydrogenation. And without going into detail, one can see that overall the barriers are smaller for the isomerization. That explains the preference for isomerization um, than hydrogenation. And overall, this structure sensitivity, the difference between the facets, is, is smaller for the isomerization than the hydrogenation. So based on this, uh, one can qualitatively explain why for the isomerization you need the 100 and the 211. And to have additionally hydrogenation, you uh, need 111 and 110 on your crystals. But that's just a qualitative uh, uh, answer of the, to the question. Then based on these EFD results uh, and putting it into a microkinetic model, and then also uh, taking care that to mix these facets in the same ratio we have it really on the experimental nanoparticles, you can quantitatively basically also model uh, the, the experimental behavior that we observe in the reactor. And so basically the modeling, and this is now these inverted triangles here and also here, so the, the, the modeling combined with the microkinetics can really explain the particle size dependence. So based on this microscopic understanding, putting it into the microkinetic model, you can really go to the macroscopic properties uh, of these particles in measured under realistic uh, conditions. And I think there are not too many examples out there. OK. Uh, this model catalyst approach um, is also continued, and that could also be uh, extended to, the, to, to perovskites, for instance. Uh, there was also another part on this poster from Thomas Wiegt. Um, on, uh, he also works with, with model catalysts and nanoparticles, and uh, doing like, these atmospheric pressure reactions. And so in these nanoparticles, you have to consider, uh, or these model catalysts, you have to consider one thing. Uh, we have about 10 to the 12 nanoparticles in our model catalyst. And uh, here is a TM image shown of some sample. Of course, we know that not every nanoparticle is exactly the same size, exactly the same shape, and also exactly the same um, facets. And so with these measurements, we average over a lot of these particles. And so the question is, or what, uh, can we do the catalysis on one particle? 
that has sometimes been done before, but can we also look into the different facets of one particle? Um, that brings me to the last poster. So this is uh, on single particle catalysis presented by, by Uri Sokorsky, Johannes Steininger, Maximilian Rath, and some others. And in this single particle catalysis, what was, was done, a very fine tip of rhodium was used. Uh, but not for STM. Uh, at the end of the tip, you have uh, is a basically a crystal. Uh, here you see the crystallography, uh, also from electron microscopy. And then this tip uh, is a particle with facets in the nanometer scale. And this we consider as a model for a single uh, catalytic particle. But then we need a method again to image that. And in this case, it's field uh, emission or field electron microscopy. Uh, and there you can see, let's say, from the top. And here is the image. You can see this tip, also uh, affected by the, by the work function. So you see the crystallography. And again, you can see um, reactants on the surface. And the best is just uh, last here to show you this last video. Um, so this is the image of the tip. Again, bright areas in hydrogen oxidation here, bright areas are active. So this is all active, and the dark is inactive. And this is at 140 centigrade at uh, constant pressure conditions. But now when you start the video, then what you see is that there are some areas around here that change between bright and dark. So they change between active and inactive, and when you analyze the video and you analyze different regions on this tip, then you see that in some regions uh, there are oscillations. So in these green areas here, uh, there are oscillations with, a, uh, with one frequency. And this is so-called coupled oscillations. So these facets, they talk to each other. And the way they talk to each other is by the surface diffusion of hydrogen. The hydrogen is so fast that even, this is about a micrometer, uh, is so fast that it couples everything. So this is just the beginning uh, of the story. There is much more on the, uh, on the poster. And so I just cut it down here. So you see, we did, we work with oxides, but we work with lithium. Uh, we work with lanthanum, but we work with metal. So the easy thing to do on the paper is just to merge everything. Okay, so to modify the lanthanum, uh, the cobalt oxide for the beginning with lanthanum. So that's, that's our goal now. Um, and then we can do surface spectroscopy and surface microscopy. I've given you an example on these systems, yeah, and uh, in, a similar, in a similar way, but with different samples. And then I've also shown you that when you combine these sort of well-defined model systems and reactions at uh, realistic conditions and also temperatures, with DFT modeling uh, and microkinetics, then you can really link um, the microscopic understanding with the macroscopic properties, and not just on a qualitative, but also on a, on a quantitative level. Uh, I know this was a lot, and, but the idea was maybe just to give you a flavor where we will go in the future, and maybe somebody has suggestions or discussions of what to do. So that brings me just to thank again the whole uh, PO8 team and you for your attention.